Hey guys, welcome back to the Japan Archives, episode 51. Like we said last week, we were going to get into another Japanese fairy tale. We were going to do Kintaro, the golden boy. But as usual, I'd like to ask Heather how she is. So how are you doing? Thomas, I am doing fantastic. And in fact, Good. I, I recently had a, a celebration of my, my yearly celebration that I have for, you know, being born thing birthday and funny enough I mean just say birthday <laughs> I know I could say birthday <laughs> so I recently had a birthday and I got a lovely present in the mail from a mysterious benefactor who I don't know this person at all because I didn't see a return address on the box <laughs> but I got a lovely 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 book of sinew which we talked about previously and we were going to come back to at some point well that day is coming soon because i have thumbed through this delightful book it is from 19 1949 it is a translation um and ed edited and translated by rh blythe it's a beautiful beautiful first edition and it, I mean, it's just, it's a lovely book. I, I just can't get over how amazed it is. The professor really loves it. And he, I, I, can't, I need to keep an eye on it because I'm scared he's going to take it. So thank you so much, Mysterious Benefactor, for this lovely book that I'm going to keep gushing over for a long time because it's like one of the absolute loveliest presents I've ever gotten. So thank you so much. How are you? I'm doing pretty good, actually. Exciting news wise, I've started finally submitting my book, my fantasy book to different literary agents and things in England. So now it's a pretty a bit of a waiting game to see what happens with that. So I'll keep you posted. But apart from that, not many other changes right now. So if you're ready, we can jump straight into the episode. Yeah, let's go. Okay. Long, long ago. So mukashi mukashi. There lived in Kyoto a brave soldier named Kintoki. Now he fell in love with a beautiful lady and married her. Not long after this, through the malice of some of his friends, he fell into disgrace at court and was dismissed. This misfortune so preyed upon his mind that he did not long survive his dismissal. He died, leaving behind him his beautiful young wife to face the world all alone. Fearing her husband's enemies, she fled to the Ashigara Mountains as soon as her husband had died, and there in the lonely forests where no one ever came except woodcutters, a little boy was born to her. She called him Kintaro, or the Golden Boy. Now the remarkable thing about this child was his great strength, and as he grew older, he grew stronger and stronger, so that by the time he was eight years old, he was able to cut down trees as quickly as any full-grown man. Then his mother gave him a large axe, and he used it to go out into the forest and help the woodcutters themselves. They called him Wonder Child, and they called his mother the Old Nurse of the Mountains, for they did not know her high rank. Another favourite pastime of Kintaro's was to smash at rocks and stones, quite unlike the other boys. Kintaro grew up all alone in the mountain wilds, and as he had no companions, he made friends with all the animals and learned to understand them and to speak their strange talk. By degrees, they all grew quite tame and looked upon Kintaro as their master, and he used them as his servants and messengers. But his special retainers were the bear, the deer, the monkey and the hare. The bear often brought her cubs for Kintaro to romp with, and when she came to take them home, Kintaro would get on her back and have a ride to her cave. He was very fond of the deer too, and would often put his arms around the creature's neck to show that its long horns did not frighten him. Great was the fun they all had together. One day in particular, Kintaro went up into the mountains, followed by the bear, the deer, the monkey, and his other friend the hare. After walking for some time up the hill and down the dales and over rough roads, they suddenly came out upon a wide and grassy plain covered with pretty wild flowers. Here indeed was a nice place where they could all have a good romp together. The deer rubbed his horns against a tree for pleasure, the monkey scratched his back, 
the hare smoothed his long ears, and the bear gave him a grunt of satisfaction. Here is a good place for a good game, Kintaro said. What do you all say to a wrestling match? The bear, being the biggest and the oldest, answered for the others. That will be great fun, she said. I am the strongest animal, so I will make the platform for the wrestlers. And so she set to work with a will to dig up the earth and to pat it into shape. All right, said Kintaro. I will look on while you all wrestle with each other. I shall give a prize to the one who wins in each round. What fun! We shall all try to get the prize, said the bear. The deer, the monkey, and the hare set to work to help the bear raise the platform on which they were all to wrestle. When this was finished, Kintaro cried out, Now begin! The monkey and the hare shall open the sports, and the deer shall be the umpire. Now, Mr. Deer, please act as umpire. Ha ha, answered the deer, I will be the umpire. Now, Mr. Monkey and Mr. Hare, if you are both ready, please walk out and take your places on the platform. Then the monkey and the hare both hopped out, quickly and nimbly to the wrestling platform. The deer, as umpire, stood between the two and called out. Red back, red back, he said to the monkey, because in Japan monkeys have red backs. Are you ready? Then he turned to the hare. Long ears, long ears, are you ready? Both the little wrestlers faced each other while the deer raised a leaf on high as signal. When he dropped the leaf, the monkey and the hare rushed upon each other, crying, Yosho, Yosho. While the monkey and the hare wrestled, the deer called out encouragingly or shouted warnings to each of them as the hare or the monkey pushed each other near the edge of the platform and were in danger of falling over. Red back, red back, stand your ground, called out the deer. Long ears, be strong, be strong. Don't let the monkey beat you, grunted the bear. So the monkey and the hare, encouraged by their friends, tried their very hardest to beat each other. The hare at last gained on the monkey. The monkey seemed to trip up, and the hare, giving him a good push, sent him flying off the platform with a bound. The poor monkey sat up rubbing his neck and his face was very long as he screamed angrily, Oh, how my back hurts! How my back hurts me! Seeing the monkey in this plight on the ground, the deer holding his leaf on high said, The round has finished! The hare has won! Kintara then opened his lunchbox, and taking out a rice dumpling, gave it to the hare, saying, Here is your prize, and you have earned it well. Now the monkey got up looking very cross, and as they say in Japan, his stomach stood up for he felt that he had not been fairly beaten. So he said to Kintaro and the others who were standing by, I have not been beaten fairly. My foot slipped and I tumbled. Please give me another chance and let the hare wrestle with me for another round. Then, Kintaro consenting, the hare and the monkey began to wrestle again. As everyone knows, the monkey is a very cunning animal by nature, and he made up his mind to get the best of the hare this time if possible. To do this, he thought the best and surest way would be to get hold of the hare's long ears. This he soon managed to do. The hare was quite thrown off his guard by the pain of having his long ear pulled so hard, and the monkey, seizing his opportunity at last, caught hold of one of the hare's legs and sent him sprawling into the middle of the days. The monkey was now the victor, and received a rice dumpling from Kintaro, which pleased him so much that he quite forgot his sore back. The deer now came up and asked the hare if he felt ready for another round, and if so whether he would try a round with him, and the hare consenting, they both stood up to wrestle. The bear came forward as umpire. The deer with long horns and the hare with long ears. It must have been an amusing sight to those who watched this queer match. Suddenly the deer went down on one of his knees, and the bear with the leaf on high declared him beaten. In this way, sometimes the one, sometimes the other, conquering, the little party amused themselves till they were all very tired. At last, Kintaro got up and said, This is enough for today. What a nice place we have found for wrestling. Let us come again tomorrow. Now we will all go home. Come along. So saying, Kintaro led the way while the animals followed. After walking some distance, they came out on the banks of the river flowing through the valley. Kintaro and his four furry friends stood and looked about for some means of crossing, but bridge there was none. The river gushed don-don on its way. All the animals looked serious. 
wondering how they could cross the stream and get home that evening. Kintaro, however, said, Wait a moment, I will make a good bridge for you. In all but a few minutes, the bear, the deer, the monkey, and the hare looked at him to see what he would do now. Kintaro went from one tree to another that grew along the river bank. At last he stopped in front of a very large tree that was growing at the water's edge. He took hold of the trunk and pulled it with all his might, once, twice, and thrice. And on the third pull, so great was Kintaro's strength that the roots gave way, and merry, merry, crash, crash, over fell the tree, forming an excellent bridge across the stream. There, said Kintaro, what do you think of my bridge? It is quite safe, so follow me. And he stepped across first. The four animals followed. Never had they seen anyone so strong before, and they all exclaimed, How strong he is, how strong he is. With all this going on by the river, a woodcutter who happened to be standing on a rock overlooked the stream, and had seen everything that had just happened. He watched with great surprise Kintaro and his animal companions. He rubbed his eyes to be sure that he was not dreaming when he saw this boy pull over a tree by the roots and throw it across the stream to form a bridge. The woodcutter, for such he seemed to be by his dress, marvelled at all he saw, and he said to himself, That is no ordinary child. Whose son could he be? I will find out before this day is done. He hastened after the strange party and crossed the bridge behind them. Kintaro knew nothing of all of this, and little guessed that he was being followed. On reaching the other side of the river, he and the animals separated. They to their lairs in the woods, and he to his mother who was waiting for him. As soon as he entered the cottage, which stood like a matchbox in the heart of the pine woods, he went to greet his mother, saying, Here I am. Oh, Kimbo, said his mother with a great bright smile, glad to see her boy home safe after the long day. How late you are today. I feared that something had happened to you. Where have you been all this time? I took my four friends, the bear, the deer, the monkey, and the hare, up into the hills, and there I made them try a wrestling match to see who was the strongest. We all enjoyed the sport and are going to the same place tomorrow to have another match. Now tell me who is the strongest of all, asked his mother, pretending not to know. Oh, mother, said Kintaro, don't you know that I am the strongest? There is no need for me to wrestle with any of them. But next to you, then, who is the strongest? The bear comes next to me in strength, answered Kintaro. And after the bear, his mother went on, next to the bear, it's not easy to say which is the strongest, for the deer, the monkey, and the hare all seem to be as strong as each other. Suddenly, Kintaro and his mother were startled by a voice coming from the outside. Listen to me, little boy. Next time you go, take this old man with you to the wrestling match. He would like to join the sport too. It was the old woodcutter who had followed Kintaro from the river. He slipped off his clogs and entered into their cottage. Yamauba and her son were both taken by surprise. They looked at the intruder wonderingly and saw that he was someone they had never seen before. Who are you? they both exclaimed. Then the woodcutter laughed and said, It does not matter who I am yet. But let us see who has the strongest arm, this boy or myself. Then Kintaro, who had lived all his life in the forest, answered the old man without any ceremony, saying, We will have a try if you wish it, but you must not be angry whoever is beaten. Then Kintaro and the woodcutter both put out their right arms and grasped each other's hands. For a long time, Kintaro and the old man wrestled together in this way each trying to bend the other's arm, but the old man was very strong, and the strange pair were evenly matched. At last the old man desisted, declaring it a drawn game. You are indeed a very strong child. There are few men who can boast the strength of my right arm. I saw you first on the banks of the river just a few hours ago, when you pulled up that large tree to make a bridge across it. Hardly able to believe what I saw, I followed you home. Your strength of arm, which I have just tried, proves what I saw this afternoon. When you are full grown, you will surely be the strongest man in all of Japan. It is a pity that you are hidden away in these wild mountains. Then he turned to Kintaro's mother, Yamauba. And you, mother, 
have you no thought of taking your child to the capital, and of teaching him to carry a sword as befits a samurai? You are very kind to take so much interest in my son, she replied. But he is, as you see, wild and uneducated. And I fear it would be very difficult to do as you say. Because of his great strength, he hurt everyone that he ever came near. I have often wished that I could one day see my boy a samurai wearing two swords. But as we have no influent friends to introduce us at the capital, I fear my hope will never come true. You need not trouble yourself about that, he said. To tell you the truth, I am not a woodcutter. I am one of the great generals of Japan. My name is Sadamitsu, and I am a vassal of the powerful lord Minamoto no Raiko. He ordered me to go around the country and look for boys who gave promise of remarkable strength, so that they may be trained as soldiers for this army. I thought that I could best do this by assuming the disguise of a woodcutter, and by good fortune I have thus unexpectedly come across your son. Now if you really wish for him to be a samurai, I will take him and present him to Lord Reiko as a candidate for his service. What do you say to this? As the kind general gradually unfolded his plan, the mother's heart was filled with great joy. She saw that here was a wonderful chance of the one wish of her life being fulfilled, that of seeing Kintaro a samurai before she died. Bowing her head to the ground, she replied, I will then entrust my son to you, if you really mean what you say. Kintaro all this time had been sitting by his mother's side, listening to what they had said. When his mother finished speaking, he exclaimed, O oh joy of joy, I am going to go with the general, and one day I shall be a samurai. Thus Kintaro's fate was settled, and the general decided to start for the capital at once, taking Kintaro with him. It need hardly be said that his mother, Yamauba, was sad at parting with her boy, for he was all that was left to her. But she hid her grief with a strong face, as they say in Japan. She knew that it was for her boy's good, and he should leave her now, and she must not discourage him, just as he was setting out. Kintaro promised never to forget her, and said that as soon as he was a samurai wearing two swords, he would build her a home and take care of her in her old age. All the animals, those he had tamed to serve, the bear, the deer, the monkey and the hare, as soon as they found out that he was going away, came to ask if they might attend him as usual. When they learned that he was going away for good, they followed him to the foot of the mountain to see him off. Kimbo, said his mother, mind and be a good boy. Mr. Kintaro, said the faithful animals, we wish you good health on your travels. They all climbed tree to see the last of him, and from the height they watched him and his shadow growing smaller and smaller till he was lost to sight. The general, Sadamitsu, went on his way, rejoicing at having so unexpectedly found such a prodigy as Kintaro. Having arrived at their destination, the general took Kintaro at once to his lord, Minamoto no Raiko, and told him all about the boy and how he had found him. Lord Raiko was delighted with his story, and having commanded Kintaro be brought to him, made him one of his vassals at once. Lord Raiko's army was famous for its band called the Four Braves. These warriors were chosen by himself from among the bravest and strongest of all his soldiers, and the small and well-picked band was distinguished throughout all of Japan for the dauntless courage of its men. When Kintaro grew up to be a man, his master made him the chief of all the Four Braves. He was by far the strongest of them all. Soon after this event, news was brought to the city that a cannibal monster had taken up its abode not far away, and that people were stricken with fear. Lord Raiko ordered Kintaro to the rescue, and he immediately started off, delighted at the prospect of trying out his sword. Surprising the monster in his den, he made short work of it, cutting off its great head, which he carried back in triumph to his master. Kintaro now rose to be the greatest hero of his country, and great was the power and honor and wealth that came with him. He now kept his promise and built a comfortable home for his old mother, who lived happily with him in the capital to the end of her days. Is this not the story of a great hero? So, that is the end of Kintaro and the Golden 
and the Golden Boy. It's not like Harry Potter and the Order of Phoenix. Kintaro, the Golden Boy. Sorry. So, what did you make of it? It has it has Hercules vibes to some extent. It really does. Also, it was a it was a happy ending. It was a good ending. That and and not a great amount of conflict. There's like no except the very beginning with his father. That's where our conflict was at the beginning. But then after that, it was just kind of went up and up and up. So really interesting story. I was I was expecting something bad to happen at the end, and then I was like, oh no, they lived happily ever after. Oh, I can get behind this. I like I like happily ever after. Uh, and I think. Also, too, we've seen, I think you've probably seen before, like the, a character with the different animals. And I'm wondering if we've seen Quintaro actually depicted, but we just weren't aware of it before. Because I feel like it's familiar somehow. Probably a bit like Momo Taro. Like you might have seen him around, but you weren't sure what he was because you didn't know the story. But once you know it, you'll see it more and you'll see. I think it's definitely one of those things because it, it is a classic fairy tale it's all it's almost in in any folk talk folklore or fairy tale book about japan this is like a standard that one that's always included so i think it's definitely depicted around japan but again if you're not sure what you're looking at then you might not necessarily really pay attention to it whereas after, like you said after we'd done the kappa episode we saw them everywhere so maybe now we'll see Kintaro everywhere. It's a very good possibility. <laughs> now I do I do have a few extra things to say to put it into a bit of perspective. I I suppose hmm. a bit maybe that might be the worst choice of words. Obviously with folk tales there are different versions whereas most of the story is the same. It's the beginning parts that do tend to be a bit different. One version where he is brought up by his mother who is known as the princess Yeigiri. The version that we read, well, the version that we had at the start of the book, which was the mother fleeing into the forests and then raising her own child. But then there, and then there is one more alternate version where the mother comes into the woods and leaves her child abandoned, basically leaving the child to die. And so he is then found by a creature known as the Yama Uba, who then brings him up from being a babe. It seems that when you look into this version of the fairy tale, they've taken two of these and fused them together because we have the beginning of the book where the mother flees into Mount Ashigara and it says he raises the she raises the child. However, partway through the book, it then starts referring to the mother as Yama Uba, which is the alternate version because a Yama Uba is not actually the mother, she is more of a yokai. So I feel that this translation has merged the two different versions together. In intentionally or unintentionally, I'm not too sure. But definitely where this book is referring to her as the Yama Uba, it's talking about her in the context of a yokai and the Yama Uba, which can translate as mountain hag, mm. is the a female yokai who dwells high up in the mountains and you are a suspicious person if you want to know where these people are residing up in the mountains wherever the cloud line is upon the slopes that is where they will be at that point in the day i wonder if i know with like um with uh momotaro and then another story i, I encountered recently that depending on what region you are in Japan, the story might be told a di bit differently. So I'm wondering if some of the different tellings are from the different regions and um, left Katie Ahern because this, he, let's say he combined a few different things that perhaps he'd heard different, several different versions of the story and kind of fused them together. This isn't left Katie Ahern. Well, this is left Katie Ahern. Which mm -hmm. one is this? This is a book called Japanese Fairy Tales by Ye Theodora Ozaki. She was a Japanese translator from the early 1900s yeah sorry i should have told you the author before but your point is still valid like likely she was piecing together different versions from the time do you try and put this into a bit of historical context minamoto no raiko lived was an actual person and he did live from 948 to 1021 if oh. you're wanting an idea of when the story might have been set Sadamitsu was also one of his generals, like it says in the book. His full name was Usui Sadamitsu. In addition to this, Minamoto no Raiko also had another general 
who was called Sakata Kintoki. And Sakata Tinko Kintoki is thought to have been the person who inspired this fairy tale. And that may be why at the start of this book, they say that Sakata Kintoki is actually the father of Kintaro. Like fusing the reality with the myth kind of thing. Mm -hmm. One more tidbit to say. So in this story, right at the end, you might remember it said that he was quested with going up a mountain to kill a demon and bringing back his head. This refers to one of the Oni from our Oni episode. Now we had the story of Shuten Doji where Minamoto no Raiko went up to the mountain to go and kill the Oni Shuten Doji and all of his Oni army so that he could rescue all the damsel in distress that had been taken from Kyoto. And that is the story that is referred to in this fairy tale. It's amazing how often we run into ties from previous episodes. I like it when it does that. It just has like a little connection and, oh, okay. So yeah, there you go. That is my story for today. I actually have a couple things to add. Um, I wrote the notes down while you were talking with my left hand. So the handwriting is atrocious, but hilarious. So you had mentioned at one point about feeling things in the stomach. Mm. I wasn't aware of this. It was something the professor told me a while back. And I've, I've got to go back and touch base with him again to make sure I'm understanding and even sharing this properly. But how in Western cultures, like we feel things like in the heart, like you have a pain in the heart or you have like your heart leaps. What I was told, and again, I'm going to verify it to make sure I did understand properly. But yet yeah, the feelings are in the stomach in Japan. So instead of feeling like things in your heart, you would feel things in your stomach, which. Ah, oh, that's cool. And so when you, as soon as you mentioned that, I was like, oh, wait a minute. I remember a conversation that we had and that that's that thing in the stomach. And also going back to the previous book I, I mentioned in the intro, the lot of things I'm running into, I am seeing in stories and in some of the folk tales, some of the things that tie into culture that we wouldn't have been aware of before without like exploring different stories or different folklores or even just like a, an aside conversation. So we're getting to understand the stories on a little bit different level because we're getting to understand a little bit more of the culture behind them. Other thing I wanted to mention, I'm going to do body parts because you're going to, you mentioned the back, like the, the monkey's back yeah. being red. I, I, I'm guessing they meant backside, but he chose to not say, or she chose to not say um, backside. She just chose to say back because um, I'm mm -hmm. guessing it is the, the bottom part of of the monkey. And something interesting, I don't know if you, you've run into this before, but uh, some of the translations that I would get for backside would be hip. So like some of my, my teachers before, um, they would like do a gesture and say, oh, you're hip, you're hip. And I'm like, that that's not your no. hip. It's like, oh, oh, shitty. But they would translate, oh, shitty, which means bottom to hip instead. So you might have heard a translation that would say like red hip as opposed to red backside. So, because I was thinking, I don't think I've ever seen any monkeys here with red backs, have you? <laughs> I don't think I have, no. So what you said would make way more sense. But I'm guessing back in the early 1900s, I, I don't think they would have mentioned that perhaps. Probably not. So any more questions then? I think for right now, I might be good. I'm, I'm really excited to hear this story. I'm so glad, I'm so glad you found it. A long time ago and <laughs> told it today so thank you you're welcome uh, so moving on to you then for today are we i mean last time was a proverb hmm. we are jumping around to something classic for our podcast we're going to go back to 100 poets one poem each it has been a while since we've been there it has indeed. So we're gonna today we're going to visit with another Minamoto, Minamoto no Sanetomo. That wasn't even intentional. It was, was not. It? <laughs> when you said Minamoto, Minamoto, I was like, oh, this is perfect. It, it's it's unintentionally themed today. So he was born September twelfth, eleven ninety two, and he died February twelfth, twelve nineteen. He was the third and last shogun of the Miyamoto clan during the Kamakura shogunate. 
His brother, his older brother was the second shogun, but he was stripped of his title due to accusations of plotting against the Hojo clan and was also eventually assassinated. Oof, okay. Sanetomo was then declared the third shogun. However, it seems that he was ruler in name only, as it was his mother that held the power of the shogun. She also used Sanetomo to fight against her father, who is the head of the Hojo clan. So for Minamoto no Sanetomo, he, to cope with the helplessness of his fate, he therefore put his efforts into writing waka poetry. He was taught by Teika, who is also included in the Ogura Hyakuin Ishu, are the 100 poets, and who praised his poetry highly. We have talked about him now and then, Teika. He was an interesting individual. We need to do an episode on him. We sure do. He was the guy who wrote those two poems in anger at the emperor, if you remember. Oh my goodness, yes. Ah, oh, mm. We have to come a back to Long time him. ago we did that. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a long time ago. Well, Senetomo wrote at least 700 poems, so he was quite prolific in his short life. He also published a private collection called the Kinkai Wakashu, and he's also included here in the Ogura Hyakunin issue. Unfortunately, in 1219, he was also assassinated by his nephew. After returning from a ceremony to honor his new role as an Udaijin. And the poem I'm going to read for you today is a is a quite kind of more a, a simple poem that's just describing the port in Kamakura. All right, Tim, if you've got your pencil and your paper already, or your uh, calligraphy brush if you're so inclined. <laughs> I am ready. I have my red Muji pen for today. Yono Nagawa Tsune ni Mogamona. Nagisu kogu, ama no obune no tsunade kanashi mo. So I'm hearing kanashi in the last line. Kanashi being um easy. No, Ooh. kanashi's not easy. That oh, what's the word? What am I thinking of? Sad. Thank you, thank you. Not easy. Sad. The 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 first line yo no naka wa. It's reminding me of another poem where the first line is yo no naka o, and we have talked about it before. Yes. And I cannot for the life of me remember what it means. Is it naka though in the sense of middle or central? Okay, so the translation is that such moving sights would never change. Fishermen rowing their small boats, pulling them to shore. So the only word I really would recognize was tsune, but... I thought that was fune, so even then, I, I feel like I think I'm completely wrong. So this one was, yeah, this one for me, I, I had to rely completely on the translation. Looking more into the English lyric, it, I like it because it's talking about a moment in time, mm. I suppose, in that something that, well, like the first lesson line says, that such moving sights would never change. It's, I suppose you could say it's holding on to the old ways, like this is how it's always been. It's never changing. Everything is nice as it is. It's not safe. It's the norm. It's calming in a way. Everything's always the same. And you can always expect it to be how you remember it. Nostalgic. There you go. That's the word I'm thinking of. It's a nos it's nostalgic. Yeah, I, I think that's why I was I was drawn to this this poem because it was that sort of simple. And also when you think about his his life how he was pulled in different directions and he was leader in name only and his only real escape was was poetry being able to go somewhere and to write about something perhaps was like a relief and de-stressing or a relief for his mind and kind of no matter how busy he was and how much everything else changed him around him he could go back and see that some places still remain calm and easy and unchanged. Hmm. Yeah, because sometimes if you have a lot of things going on or you're helpless and you can't do something, just taking a moment, looking at your atmosphere, looking at the environment or going out into nature and seeing this peaceful scene can help to relieve your mind or relieve your stress, even if for a short moment for a small amount of time. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, that poem, the adding on what you've told us about his life, it does 
potentially add a lot more hidden meaning to the poem itself if you put it in the context of everything that was going on for him at the time so yeah that, that's lovely that's a really nice poem thank you so much i i'm i'm glad you liked it i i know sometimes we go for poems that have like a deeper meaning but sometimes having a peaceful reflection is it's nice, also nice. <laughs> yes and also having another minamoto was I, I, when, what when a I, very strange coincidence. Why would this always happen? I'm I'm a little disappointed that I don't have anything about like a monkey or a deer or a bear as the poem. Instead of we're talking about like ships and ports <laughs> next time. <laughs> but yes, thank you so much for the poem today. You are so welcome. Ah, okay then. So that's everything from me today for sure. Is that everything from you? I believe so at this moment in time. Well, guys, thank you so much for listening this week. As for next week, so episode 52, we've got a few things in the works. We're working, we're looking through a few different ideas. So we're not sure quite yet what it will be, but there will be something, of course. There usually is. So yeah, thank you so much for tuning in this week. If you wish to look at the show notes for this episode, you can find that over at japanarchivespodcast.com you can also check that website out to see a growing database we're trying to work on for Japanese history it expands upon some things that we've talked about before but there's also a lot of other things on there we haven't talked about yet you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Japan Archives and if you wish to see some of my explorations of Japan you can find that over at nexus travels that's n-e-x-u-s underscore travels but do you have anything else to add heather thank you guys so much for listening and we really appreciate it again thank you for coming back every week all right then guys thank you again for tuning in this week and we'll catch you next monday matane <laughs>